So a preference center is really a way to, I think, keep a customer. They like your brand, they want to hear from you, but let them do it how they want to. So it's consent, but kind of on the, the back end via choice. The idea of, I don't want to use third party cookies. So instead I'm going to use first party data. So I'm absolutely going to be increasing my privacy risk. Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us 5 years, 10 years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we have Jody Daniels with us today. She is the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a privacy consultancy. They help companies from startups to Fortune 100 create privacy programs, build customer trust and achieve GDPR, CCPA and in general privacy law compliance. Jody is a certified privacy professional and serves as the outsourced DPO or privacy officer for a few companies. Let's get started. Jody, thanks for coming. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, to get started, first party data, it's all the rage these days. What do you see people are doing or most people are asking you to advise them on? when it comes to embracing first party data and moving into cookie-less? Yeah, well, I think first the move to cookie-less is actually geared from the browsers and a little bit less from the United States laws because the United States laws is, it's still opt out. I can kind of serve you any kind of ads I want. I just need to tell you about them and give you some choices. So there's certainly a move to first party data. There's going to be a big push to have logins on websites that didn't traditionally have that. They might've had a lot of content, advertising supported. They expect and anticipate a drop in the advertising revenue. So now they need to figure out, well, you know, how else am I going to be able to know who is here? And not just even a drop of the revenue, but to be able to really understand their audience and have the right contextual ads, I need to know who's here. So let's create an environment where it's a login. Let's uh, get more emails so that I can enhance email marketing campaigns. So all email marketing agencies are going to be very busy, I think, if they aren't already. And anyone who's also sort of in the walled gardens, think about your social media platforms and others, there's a big push to to really hone in on the content in those environments and be able to produce some advertising again in that situation. So there's certainly a big push now to kind of get ready if you've been paying attention, but there's a lot of companies out there who are not, and they're going to have a big wake up call, I think soon. Yeah. So there's quite a contradiction, right? Because in a way it's a push towards being more privacy first. And we keep talking about privacy first marketing, but in the U S you have an opt out scenario. And now because we want the world to be more privacy first, you're going to need to actually start collecting personal data and start complying full on. Am I missing something with that? No, you're absolutely right. The idea of, I don't want to use third party cookies. So instead I'm going to use first party data means I'm actually going to collect real and I, I don't mean, when I say real, I guess I, I don't mean to undermine the concept that cookies and IP and, and all the browsing and everything on, in the digital world isn't real, but now I really have name and an email and I, I truly have on my servers this type of information. So I'm absolutely going to be increasing my privacy risk totally. and the security risk because of this particular move. So it's a, it's definitely a bit of an oxymoron of what we have going on here uh, in this world. So it, it's, 
it's it's very much a uh, kind of a funny situation if you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm happy. I'm happy there's there's less tracking, okay, less profiling that people understand what's going on. But at the same time, I'm always worried that the legal framework steers away from real control, which leads me to asking you something else. How do you see consent as opposed to real control, or even easier, how do you see consent as opposed to privacy by design, if that is a question? Well, I think you can have privacy by design and even consent at the same time. I think the philosophy here in the United States has always been company first, individual second, which is flip-flop from how the EU and quite honestly, most of the rest of the world looks at it. It's the individual first, company second. So in this particular situation, I also think it depends on what consent looks like. Because we've been so company first, consent in the United States often is a pre-ticked box, a condition of service. I can't sign up for this unless I agree to text messaging and email messaging. Well, maybe I don't want either of them. I just want your service. You can email me about my service, but I should also have to get text messaging. But people have said, well, I consented. Well, I didn't consent. You bundled it all together. You are starting to see the laws identify a consent with more of a GDPR-like focus, sort of that definition. We're moving more there. So we're not quite all the way to opt in unless you'd like to. And there's very much a movement towards if you consent, the understanding that I really want to be on your list. If I consent, I want to hear from you. It's actually better for the company to only market to those people. But not all companies are there yet. And so it's sort of a slow progression as we as we get there. But I do believe in kind of that privacy by design. Let me think about it first. What are the objections that the person might have <clears throat> to even consenting? Maybe I don't want to consent because I don't know what you're going to do with my data. But if I design the landing page correctly and I explain here's why I want to know everything about you and your shoe size and your favorite color and your teddy bear's name, right? Whatever it is, let me explain how I use that. Think about the objections first, create that element of trust with the individual, and then I'm more apt to sign up for your list and you can market me all day long. But then you should also give me some choices because maybe you market too much and I don't want to only have one unsubscribe to get me off your list. Maybe I want to hear from you on my terms. And that's, I think, a big part of the privacy by design that's kind of missing. It's like all or nothing. We don't always have the in-between steps. If we were to understand that there's a move towards more control, more user agency, how do you envisage that new level of control? where people can really tell you how they want you to manage their data. What is the future of consent? Well, I think it needs to be, you know, not four point font. uh, And again, not bundling everything. I think it goes back to a very clear experience and it's kind of dependent on the type of consent I'm offering. If it's for email marketing, Where I'm signing up, it's clear with a box that explains what is happening with that information. If it's going to be the future type of cookie, some other type of digital identifier, you know, here in the United States, we're we're still, it's not an opt-in model. It's very much, I'm just telling you, here's what we have. And I'm not sure we're going to move to an opt-in model here in the States. The, The consequences are pretty significant for companies, and I'm not sure they're all here wanting to take those when there's not a law pushing them. Yeah. So from a consent standpoint, I think it it's um, kind of what we've been talking about, right? It needs to be very, very obvious and very clear and separate by the types of marketing that I'm engaging in. But I do believe on the back end that maybe I could select. So think about a preference center or a privacy page that talks about here's my, my, vision. Here are my principles. 
And here are your choices. Do you engage in SMS? You get to decide here. Do you engage in email marketing? How often do you want it to be? Is it daily, weekly, monthly? My favorite is when I opt out and they ask me, why did I opt out? Well, because you sent me too many emails and you didn't give me another choice. So I'm choosing to opt out. So a preference center is really a way to, I think, keep a customer. You want to hear from, they want to engage with you. They, they like your brand. They want to hear from you, but let them do it how they want to. So it's consent, but kind of on the, the back end via choice, I guess is what I'd say. Thank you. That's perfect. So a preference center makes all the sense as the future of, of consent where it's not hidden as, oh, let's see if I can somehow trick you into consenting and then I'll, I'll make it disappear. You won't have that choice in sight anymore unless you scroll all the way to the bottom of an email to unsubscribe or go somewhere into settings and go crazy to define your preferences. If you have a preference center, I guess you're also saving money and avoiding risk because it gives you a chance for people to exercise their rights in self-service mode so they don't bother you with you know data subject requests. That's a, that's a very good point. Absolutely. I think people will likely make a request because they don't trust you as a company. They're mad. Something's gone off and they're just unhappy. I think there's a few exceptions, potentially, if you really collect some sensitive data, there's no further business relationship. They might have some different views, but generally speaking, people are just, when they're going to submit, tell me what you have on me, or I want to delete it. It's because they don't trust you as a company. If you give the control to the person and let them make these choices, well, there's you're establishing a sense of trust. You're absolutely going to be able to save on the operational piece of those individual rights. And also, depending on the type of medium, let's pick on email marketing again, you're going to save money because so many email service providers charge you by the number of emails you have. Well, or CRM system. If I don't need you in there, so you fully choose to opt out, then that is actually a cost savings. Now, obviously we want to try and keep them, but you also don't want to keep sending messages that are unopened because that affects your delivery rate. So, you know, when you kind of think about all of those different metrics combined, it can all tie back to choice. And so many people I think are scared because I'm, I don't, I, it was so hard to get the customer in the first place. I don't, I don't want to lose them. And I'm a small business owner. I don't want to lose that someone every time someone's on the list. Yeah. But at the same time, I want to talk to the people who want to hear from me. And it's the same with really any brand. You want to have the conversation the way they want to, because that's when you're going to sell whatever it is you're trying to sell. And isn't that the point of marketing? You're trying to build a relationship so someone actually buys the thing <laughs> that you have. You have to do it on their terms. Otherwise, you're just, you're pushing. And some people will buy based on that, but most people won't. It's like you're keeping your customer in a leash because you're afraid that if you let go, they'll run away and, and it, you're forcing them. And in the end, you want to build trust, as you say. So I guess we're going in that direction, no matter what. Because if some companies are starting to provide these preferences and be more transparent and give you more choice and you have these preference centers all over the place, that has a, a competitive a competitive advantage. So I guess as, as the word spreads, there'll be an expectation that you can manage your data or am I being too optimistic? I do think that's the direction of where we're going. I think you're, you're finding some of the bigger companies are moving that way and you're going to see others that really recognize this as an advantage and a competitive edge. And that's the direction where we're going. And so then if you're not doing these things, you're going to be left behind. And as a consumer or even a B2B business, you're going to look at that company and say, well, why aren't you doing that? And all these people are doing it over here. Why aren't, why aren't you doing it? So I do think that's the future direction. We're just, I'd say like the infant toddler stage of where we are. What's going on with cookie banners in the US? How confused are oh people, gosh. businesses? Cookie what's banners. Happening? The bane of my existence. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to cookie banners. I think for definitely the smaller and mid-sized companies, I think the larger companies are, are, are starting to get it. But there's this idea of, do I have to have a cookie banner? And because then everyone else has a cookie banner. So kind of going to what we had just talked about other companies and the expectation, 
now everyone thinks I have to have a cookie banner. A cookie banner is a very nice, nice to have. The CCPA says you need to provide notice at the time of collection. It can also be at a privacy notice, but a cookie banner is a great best practice to have. However, the cookie banner shouldn't say, for example, allow all cookies if I have no other choice, because what if I don't want to allow all cookies? Where is my, no, don't allow all cookies. And so, so many cookie banners are, are different than the EU. Some of them are actually just like the EU's um, that we see, but there's some significant confusion and not understanding the nuance between the US and the EU. And also it can't just be, here's a cookie banner, allow them all if you're not going to give a choice. So at least say, okay, we use these cookies, click here for a privacy notice, got it, okay, keep moving on. But even just the language that people are using, it might seem so small, but it's actually a really big piece. And the other significant part is where it's blocking the page, whether it's on a mobile site or a website, and you're literally interfering with the user experience with a cookie banner that is often improperly worded. So people really need to understand the requirements between their jurisdictions and what the verbiage should be within each of those. And the a whole point is of a cookie banner is notice and choice. At least the choice should be a minimum, at a minimum in the United States, of linking to where they can make a change. If you want to make it an extra click, okay, not a best practice, but okay. But the, the language is, is critical and the experience. That's very good. I hate cookie banners. I hate them. I hate them. And in fact, I've always thought, why, why not ponder whether it's worth using cookies that are not exempted in Europe, right? In Europe, we, we always had analytical or analytics cookies that at least in France, the... Uh, the ACNIL, the agency, the local uh, supervisory authority was very clear. I was very, uh, was very transparent on that point. Analytics cookies, as long as they're not integrated with ads cookies, they can be used and you don't need consent for them. They are part of how you maintain your website. And now even in the privacy regulation uh, in the draft, there's an article that provides that exception. And then I thought, that's good. Then people are faced with a choice, either collect a lot of data about very few people, because they have to consent, and the standard for consent is stronger, and few people will accept, so this size of the sample will be smaller, or very little data, very shallow, but across your entire audience. It's anonymous, but it's about everyone, so the sample size is, is big. Okay, so with that, we think if we were to take this to the next level, right? So now we've got preference centers, and companies are starting to emulate each other and people feel in control, there's more trust, probably less risk as some people will opt out entirely and then you have to handle less data. So things looking a bit better. Next level, and the first thing that people will be wondering is why would I need to have the same data across so many different preference centers with the same data, which is what Tim Berners-Lee has been pushing for solid and that idea of decentralizing some of your I don't think like all of your data can be predefined, even pre-understood, <laughs> even previously understood and confined to a single place from which you share. But I guess contact details, basic preferences, basic info could be. Do you see a cross-brand preference center that doesn't lead to, again, second party and third party data, but rather that it's in the hands of people as part of that future? Or do you think that's sort of a hippie dream? I think there are some people and even some of the laws that would like to be able to see the transparency down to company A shared it with company B, company A shared it with company C. I think the reality of that is so hard. Think about your, your mega multinational companies that are sharing data for all different types of reasons. And, and they might not be nefarious. They're just, this is the way we operate our business. It's all interconnected these days. So I think the reality of that is, uh, I, I don't think that's a realistic future personally. I think what would be more meaningful 
It's kind of like the situation now with the cookies. The average person has absolutely no clue the name of any of these players. It means nothing to them. So sure, I'll just click out of all of them because nothing is meaningful. Or, oh, I like that name. I don't like that name. I think what's more important is the type of data. So we share it with advertising partners. We share it with analytics partners. We just completely sell it to make money because we can. And that's why you got a catalog in the mail from someone you've never heard of before. That is more meaningful. And then the person can just make that decision. Now, internally, the company needs to know all of those things because if Jody doesn't like the catalog that she received in the mail, you've made it too difficult for me to stop receiving them. <clears throat> Once you open the thing and it says, must mail in a letter to stop getting my catalog, I'm just going to go and submit an individual rights request that says, don't sell my data, delete my data. Now the company has to know where it all is. So I think it's a very important item on the inside. It's just not meaningful to the average person because no one knows the name of the companies and what they do. The categories, which is what I do actually like about what the California law has done. It said it's it's putting them into categories of information and the types of third parties you've shared them with. That's very good. Uh, people don't understand. And if you don't understand, you do the opposite. You don't agree to things you don't understand. The basic instinct is you disagree just in case rather than accept all, which is what companies are expecting. Or delete all. I don't know any of these. I don't like this concept. I'm just, forget you. Maybe three of them might've been okay, but I'm just going to delete them all. One last question. The uh, Google Privacy Sandbox, right? So the very the, the very thing that started this, this problem, the move towards cookie-less, Google deprecating third-party cookies as others had done before, and them owning the largest share of the market, they, they of course, they rep represent the biggest threat. And now what's going to happen with people aggregated within cohorts, and it seems like it's looking more and more like the Facebook interest graph or more and more like something where you don't need to have one-on-one -on -one tracking where companies are tracking you via cookie. Instead, you're part of an interest graph and therefore an interest group or a flock as it's being called or even cohorts that are created ad hoc by some companies and there's this new sort of fletch proposal. So if you're going to have that, do you see any threat, any threats? Do you see any issues with that? They're still collecting some type of information. I think it'll be interesting to see, are there minimums that are required for that? Because there could be some interest groups that just don't have a lot of people. But I think the idea of, of aggregating to me has always you know, individually felt like, well, that's the whole point. You're aggregating so that you can't identify Jody. You know, Jody likes these kinds of things. So You've inferred something about me, you know about me. Again, you're going to provide a notice that explains yeah. what that is. You're going to, I should be able to opt out of that type of advertising. So if I don't, if I have this ad, I should be able to opt out of it. But the idea of being able to do it on an aggregated basis makes sense. From an advertiser's perspective, we'll just need to see how effective it is. And it, the, the money will follow if it's effective and then everyone will, will be happy again until the next piece comes along <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> and yes. we'll unwind what that is. And, and I don't know if I feel like it's, you know, aggregate, deaggregate, aggregate, deaggregate. So it'll be interesting to see which direction we continue to go to, but it makes sense just logically yeah. that yeah. if you can pull people together, so it doesn't need to be one-to-one, -one, you can make an effective, effective advertisement, the advertiser is getting the business value that they're seeking. And I, if I want none of it can still opt out, hmm. it seems reasonable. Yeah, it does sound, sound okay on his face. Um, and I had to, I need to add one more thing, Apple. So do you think, how do you see Apple talking about again, cookie less and IDFA less as they call it. So again, no deduplication, no single you know, user ID. And again, same pattern. It's like all the small players are complaining because they're being pushed away and marketers are going to be, you know, of course, putting more money 
on the on the world gardens with this identity and this first party and all that all that stuff we've heard over and over but on the apple initiative i guess we are doing something else we are even accepting that apple defines privacy uh are you okay with that how do you see apple and privacy do you have a view on that i think and i know some people will disagree with me So Apple, in my view, is not a perfect company, but I do like how they approach privacy. First, they take a stand. They're taking their definition of privacy and they're making it known to people. Go to their page on privacy. It is huge, big monster view of each product that they have. They make it super easy for the average person to understand what is happening. And they really believe and and make it a part of their conversation and their feature set the individual first. Yeah. I think I prefer a tech company to define privacy over a government entity that generally doesn't understand technology. Um and the technology companies generally adapt a lot quicker. Governments around the world are always extremely reactive and first trying to understand the technology in the first place. And then you always have other players who are going to try and circumvent what is happening. So there's already chatter around other types of identifiers and will that work and and you know does that undermine Apple does is it really smart? I think time will kind of tell to see what will happen with those. But I'm I support and have been generally one of the people that likes what Apple is doing and trying to educate and be a leader in an industry to curb some of the bad behavior that has happened. And I do think that there's been companies who have been egregious and have pushed the envelope on the bad behavior. And it's kind of like kindergarten where the one person who did something they shouldn't made the rule for everybody. And it's, in my view, in the real world, kind of the same thing. For one thing, they don't use cookie banners. <laughs> right. <laughs> Joey, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.